Welcome to this third and last part of this short Bitcoin cryptography series. And today we're talking about Bitcoin mining explained in great detail. We're going to be talking about nonces, about Merkle roots, about SPV, and much, much more. So if those things are quite new to you, this is the right place to learn this today. But I do want to warn you, if you've been skipping the past episodes, you might be lost at some point because I'm going to dive right in and I'm actually going to build on top of all these things that we learned in the past. For those that watch this for the very first time, my name is Julian. My mission is to make people crypto fit, explain people blockchain, cryptocurrencies, entrepreneurship mindset, but also low level stuff such as cryptography. And this is what we've been discussing. If you're watching the entire cryptography crash course series, two thumbs up, you are gonna be rewarded in a huge manner today because today a lot of stuff will come together. So without further ado, let's dive right in, go into the screen share and discuss this 15th episode about Bitcoin mining. As a quick reminder, what is a block? We talked about a lot of these things in the past already. A block is nothing else than, well, the transactions pool together, it's a batch. Um, in Bitcoin, the block size is one megabyte. So depending on if we're using regular transactions or segwit transactions, we talked about this in the last episode, we can store around 4,200 to 8,400 transactions max. Now, depending on how many inputs and outputs we have, this can obviously vary greatly. These blocks get numbered. The Genesis block has number zero. And from there on, we have been numbering those blocks. So now another question that gets a lot asked when it talks about blockchain and mining is what is mining? And we're going to actually look into great detail, but I want to get some stuff out of the way. What mining actually is, is getting all these transactions. And I took this picture out of my book, Cryptocurrencies Explained Simply. So these are basically the transactions and this is simplified. We'll go into the cryptographic part a bit later. And we need to put them together and then create this block. And here you can find the nonce, basically the last little missing piece. Now here, the big caveat again, Bitcoin uh, mining is not creating Bitcoins. Mining is putting these transactions into a block. That's why it's also called finding a block. Great, let's dive a bit more into the nitty gritty part. And in order to do this, we need to understand what a Merkle root is, how we get from there to the Merkle parent, and then how we call how we can create a Merkle tree. So let's look how this works. Well, we hash all the transactions in an ordered list with SHA-256. So we put them all after each other. And here is now where it gets important. If we have an odd number of hashes, then obviously one would be singled out. And this just means we duplicate the last one. So imagine this here, this would be one transaction, another transaction. Let's imagine this transaction would be alone. There's no second one. We just duplicate it and hash this. Now we pair those hashes and we concatenate them. Concatenating just means we put them right after another and then hash them again. And we repeat the process until there's only one hash left. And this is what's called the Merkle root. Now the next level out of this is called the Merkle parent. And the entire thing here is called the Merkle tree. And now we have this Merkle root that basically includes all the transactions. If one of those transactions would be changed, the entire Merkle root would be changed. And for a transaction to be changed means the information in the transaction is unchanged, right? So this is always really important. So now what happens to this Merkle root? Well, the Merkle root gets added into the block header. And the block header is nothing else than the metadata of the block. The first four bytes are the version. This is the set of features and what's included. Then we have the 32 bytes of the previous block that makes the blockchain. The next 32 bytes is the Merkle root of the current block. Then we have the timestamp and that's four bytes. Um, I'm going to mention this in just a second. Then we have the bits that allows to encode some proof of work and that's another four bytes. And then we have the nonce, which is also four bytes. A nonce means number used only once or a nonce. Um, and this number is what's used, uh, what, what the miners use to change in order to look for the proof of work. It actually doesn't only use this one. It has to work with the Merkle root as well, and we're going to be discussing this in a second. Here, this is some extra credit most people don't notice, but we will need some kind of fork, nevertheless, in Bitcoin after 2106. And the reason is because we are running out of Unix timestamps. The Unix style timestamps count as seconds after January 1st, 1970. 
Now, 4 bytes, so that's 32 bits, is 2 to the power of 32 seconds. And you can calculate that, that's 136 years max afterwards, we're running out of space. So we need some kind of fork there anyways. Interesting that Satoshi didn't think of that and didn't just add some extra bytes. But uh, anyways, maybe, uh, maybe he said, hey, let's have a plan for Bitcoin that long, but it's probably not going to last that long. Um, interesting kind of to think about this. So if you add all this together, the block header has exactly 80 bytes. Now, where does the mining come in and what is this proof of work? And this is exactly what this last thing here is, the nose. Mining is proof of work because we are proving that it took us a lot of work to create a, a block, but it was really, really easy to actually verify. And this is where the term mining is actually coming from because it takes a lot of work to get gold out of the ground, but it's very, very easy to verify that it's gold. So it's not about getting the Bitcoins out. So this is quite um, an important uh, differentiation. Obviously, finding a known is very similar to finding gold. It's very easy to do, but it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to do, very easy to verify. Now, how does this work? Well, what the miners have to do is they have to double SHA-256, so run it twice through the hashing algorithm SHA-256, and they need to get a hash out of the block header. And this block hash has to start with a certain amount of zeros. And this is where the difficulty comes in. Because you can just calculate, if I have to find a certain amount of zeros at the beginning, well, in order to find one zero at the beginning, it's a 50% chance because the bit can either be a zero or a one. And then from there, the second one is 25%, then it goes down to one eighth, and it keeps going down. And well, in, if we go all the way down to the first 73 bits, well, this is 0 0.5 to the power of 73 or one in 10 to the 22. This is an insane small number. And so this is where all this mining and hashing is coming from because what all these miners are doing out there, they're just trying, in this case, the nonce in order to understand what's actually coming out. And since it's impossible to predict what's coming out, well, in this case, you just have to try. Now, for those that actually understand the math, and again, you're doing some extra credit, you will see quite fast that the nonce only with two to the power of 32 possibilities is actually quite limited. You can see this here, right? We don't have that much extra space actually in this entire uh, thing to, to try all these things through. So what we actually have to do, and this is what miners actually have to do is they have to change the Coinbase transaction. Where does the Coinbase transaction go? Because this then changes the transaction ID and this changes this part here the Merkle root, and this changes the entire block hash. And this is quite interesting to think how complex this is. Um, in Bitcoin, obviously, this difficulty gets adjusted every 2016 blocks that takes around every two weeks to make sure that it takes those miners around 200, 2016 blocks to find uh, for every two weeks so that one block takes around 10 minutes until they find one of those new blocks. And basically, what is a block? Putting all those transactions in, finding a nonce that works, and kind of mixing it all together. Quite an, uh, quite an inefficient process. But at the end, the mining really guarantees the stability and guarantees the backing. Because you know that all this work and all this effort went in. And in order to kind of copy this or undo it, you would have to put in the same amount of effort again. And this is what stabilizes the entire chain. If you want to see an example here, um, let me just open that so you can see this. And this is a pure example. I just dug this out randomly. This is where you can see here. This is the hash here. You can see those numbers of zeros. You can see the previous block. You can see how many transactions were included here. Now, we know that in theory it could be 4,200 if we look at the size here. So obviously the block was maxed out. But so obviously there's a lot of different inputs and outputs. Then you can see a lot of these things in here. You can see the mining pool that won that. You can see the difficulty here and uh, pretty much everything is included here. Here you can actually see the nodes that was used. And all this is very, very easy to be verified um, to, uh, for any outside miner, but very difficult to try and find. Here you can actually see um, the Merkle root of all the transactions. If one of those transactions here would get changed, okay, I scrolled a bit too fast now, if one of those would get changed, the Merkle root would be changed, and then the hash would be changed, and nothing is valid anymore because 
the previous block is included in this hash and the next block includes this block hash. And this is how a chain is then created. Fantastic. We mentioned mining pools, so let's briefly talk about this. Well, instead of one person trying all this through and hardly ever getting any mining reward, because how often do you actually manage to find this? It's, it depends on how much hashing power do you submit. So you have these pools and they share the profit. Now you could think, okay, so let's imagine I'm one of those mining, uh, those pool miners that like contributes the hashing power to a pool. What would happen if I would just then change the transaction where the actual rewards go to? Because I could then steal those. How do I make sure that they actually go to the mining pool operator? Well, it's very simple. The Coinbase transaction goes to the owner. So the Merkle root in this case here would be set. And uh, well, then the, any miner cannot really cheat. One other kind of mention here, is everything stored in this blockchain? No, actually only the most important info is stored as all this hash. For example, out of a blockchain, you cannot see the actual transactions. The actual transactions have to be stored separately. And that's absolutely fine because no one could cheat on this because if someone tried to cheat to store different transactions somewhere, the hashes wouldn't match anymore. Also, for example, the UTXO set would be shared, uh, would be stored somewhere else. Also, obviously, the SegWit tree, something we discussed later, is stored somewhere else. And you have all these different servers and websites who can store this. And this has nothing to do with centralization as long as the blockchain corresponds appropriately and as long as the blockchain, so all those hashes, are stored decentralized. That's, I think, a very, very important part. Fantastic. Now, there's one last thing. Could we make this a bit more efficient? And there is. And this is called a simple payment verification, SPV. And this is also seen as a light note. And uh, how you could imagine this here is, and this is again taken out of my book, uh, just a simplification. Instead of basically storing the entire blockchain, you just have to store certain things. And this would allow you to verify everything. So instead of just storing those hashes with all the attached information, which is basically what a full node would have to do, they have to store all this information. Well, you just store certain parts that are just enough to kind of construct the entire tree and then be able to check is the root actually matching. So in this case here, you could store, for example, this part, this part, this part, and this part. And at the end, you would be able to verify that the root is correct. So that the odds of someone trying to cheat you are really, really, really low. Now, what you cannot do, obviously, is you cannot verify the exact transaction, but you know that something actually is the way it is. Now, there still needs to be enough other people who store the full set of data, the full info, only then you can fully trust. But an SPV works quite well, for example, some of those uh, hosted wallets that most of us are using, because instead, instead of storing gigabytes of data for everything, you just need to store hundreds of megabytes. And then, obviously, this is a humongous difference. But probably in the future, with data storage and internet speeds getting a lot faster, maybe storing 200 gigabytes becomes as easy as storing 200 megabytes. And probably at some point, it's as easy as storing 200 kilobytes today. Fantastic. I think this is really cool um, because what you probably notice right now is that Satoshi didn't invent anything new. He or she or they basically just reassembled some really cool cryptography. And this is then how the entire Bitcoin system is working. And all that's added to it is script, a program language that we might talk about in one of those really later videos when we kind of do a different series, not talk about cryptography, but talk about something else. But this is what's very, very interesting and I think quite fascinating. If you like this and now maybe there's a light bulb that just went on, you're like, oh, wow, this is how a Bitcoin transaction actually works. This is how it gets into mining. This is why a blockchain is seen as immutable. Then, hey, let me know in the comments below. Let me know if you like this stuff. If you have a question, let me know. Give me a thumb up. Give me two thumbs up if you want to subscribe to the channel if you want to be updated whenever a new video comes out because we're actually going to continue this crash course cryptography and we are talking about a topic that comes up a lot and that is what happens when quantum computers pop up? How secure is the cryptocurrency cryptography and therefore how secure are my coins? So definitely some very interesting stuff. I hope I see you. Yours truly, Julian.